Hi, I'm Noah and welcome to Architecture in Sci-Fi Film. Today I'll continue the talk about Marvel Cinematic Universe and their take on alien architecture. In the previous video I covered both volumes of Guardians of the Galaxy, so now I'll talk about Thor. This subgenre of sci-fi is usually called space opera, because it's more about fantastic adventures set in space and less about the science of it. Thus architecture in this world is usually more extravagant and less technical. The MCU took us to a fantastic realm in 2011 when they released Thor, a place where magic and technology are intertwined. Based on the comic books, which in turn are inspired by Norse mythology, the movie presents a world where gods live, Asgard, one of the nine realms. Since then, Asgard was revisited twice, in Thor The Dark World and Thor Ragnarok. Each iteration added new layers and refined the look of this city slash planet. Aside from Asgard, we get glimpses of other realms, Jotunheim and Vanaheim, and in the most recent movie we are taken to Sakaar, this universe's dumping ground. Each of these has their own style and strong personality, from the golden city to a frozen landscape and from a medieval battlefield to a countryside junkyard. The contrast couldn't be bigger, but how does this help the story? Or in other words, how is architecture used in storytelling? The small things first, Vanaheim is on screen for a few minutes in the beginning of the second installment and it's only a battlefield. Since it's one of the nine realms, it must look the part, old and a bit on the fantasy side. It is inspired by traditional Mongolian architecture, especially the yurt, which is a portable round tent. That's because in the comics the people of Vanaheim are mostly nomadic. On Jotunheim, home of the frost giants, we see a world in ruins with a once grand architecture that's now in decay. The imposing structures we see in the opening credits are later crumbling and covered in ice. This frozen world draws inspiration from the aesthetics of stalactites and stalagmites and it is pretty straightforward. The environment is dark, so much of the details are not really visible and it's hard to decipher where the rock formation ends and the build structures begin. I really like this effect of blending the artificial with the natural especially since the artificial is made of straight lines and right angles, not some organic shapes. On the other hand though, the image of Jotunheim before the war seems pretty desolate too. It didn't feel like a world lived in. It's obvious more attention was given to the crumbling world than to its previous state. But the pièce de résistance is of course Asgard. The first movie released in 2011 established a style that's pretty much canonical at this point. Nonetheless, each movie that followed changed things around, adding new layers and depth to this realm. The approach was to create something that is very old, but also very advanced, a style called by VFX supervisor Wesley Sewell as future antiquity. Because the people of Asgard live such long lives, it makes sense that their city doesn't change much over millennia. It stands to reason that they preserve a style, improve and refine it, rather than radically change things every hundred years, like the variations of styles throughout our own history. To achieve this timeless effect, they went for large buildings with minimal decorations. The accent is on shape variation rather than details. There are curvilinear forms and some organic and industrial influences, but the overall feeling is grandiose and majestic. The concept art for Asgard included a map of the realm, revealing the key elements. Odin's tower, the bifrost connecting the tower to the observatory, and the pattern of the triquetra, a symbol found in Celtic art and other North European cultures. Those structures are pretty much unchanged in all three movies, but the same cannot be said about the rest of the city. In the first movie the city is golden, from the largest to the smallest buildings, including most of the interiors we see. Odin's tower, inspired by a pipe organ, dominates the city with its grandiose presence. While this is a powerful image, I cannot help but wonder what is going on inside this massive structure. The vault is under the towers, the coronation hall is open, so what's in the rest of it? And just judging by the size of the coronation hall, that's pretty much like a stadium, the rest of the tower is about 2 kilometers tall. That's roughly two times the height of Burj Khalifa, with just a few dozen balconies. The lack of natural light inside is a serious issue and makes no sense here. The logic is sacrificed just to achieve this impressive look. If an automated factory or a tomb can serve its purpose without bringing natural light inside, a palace does not. It is true, medieval castles had few windows and small openings toward the outside, due to military reasons, but the large ones all had inner courts. 
But moving away from this issue, the rest of the city is quite beautiful, with a lot of imaginative designs for their buildings. Most of them look like they serve a purpose and work well within this environment, creating some truly spectacular vistas. All of them are well grounded, except one. The floating paints that make for an awkward introduction to this golden city. When I saw the movie for the first time, I thought they were supposed to be some form of wind turbines, but I'm sure now that wasn't the intention. No other building or structure floats, and again, its purpose is unclear, so I think the choice of using this design here was a little unfortunate. Anyway, by the second movie, some of these aspects were changed for the better. Odin's tower, while still incredibly large, seems to have a better scale with the rest of the city, and a lot more openings and balconies. Its height is considerably smaller, but the general shape and finishes are kept the same. The changes also include the Bifrost, that now has some form of suspension cables and towers to the sides, making it a bit more realistic. Of course, there are no railings. Why would there be any? It's not like there's a huge body of water with sharp rocks underneath. That leads to waterfalls, directly in space. What is interesting is that Thor The Dark World brought a much needed feeling of realism to this world. Most of the buildings we see are made of stone, there is a lot more vegetation and a larger variety of structures. And there's a Medina, an old city, with open plazas and we also get to see the street level. It is heavily inspired by Roman architecture, combined with Gothic and Romanic elements from all over Europe. This fits perfectly with the tone of the movie, that's a bit more dramatic and less comedic. Director Alan Taylor, who previously worked on Game of Thrones and Rome, brought more layers to this superhero story, adding texture, patina and a bit of reality into this golden realm. However, this felt more fantasy, closer to Lord of the Rings and less science fiction, pretty much what the first movie tried to avoid. The shift in tone happened once more with the third movie, but in comparison to the previous change, it wasn't so dramatic. It actually tried to find the middle ground between the two versions of Asgard. The base layer is still stone, massive buildings with volumetric details carefully composed with this mountain landscape, and added a lot of metalwork, flamboyant golden details inspired by gothic cathedrals. The modern futuristic touch is present with wing patterns and some organic shapes, but it doesn't take anything away from feeling the age of this ancient city. The Bifrost Bridge, however, changed once again, ditching the tall pillars with cables in favor of a more human-sized parapet. Also noteworthy here is the added vegetation in public spaces, a common feature of utopic cities, because it makes the built environment more welcoming. The exact opposite can be said about Sakaar. There's not a plant in sight. Everything is junk, repurposed, adapted, colored, chaotic junk. Although there is a lot of metal, most of it is painted over in bright primary colors. Heavily influenced by Jack Kirby's style, this place is a mess, in the best way possible. Layers upon layers of pipes, cables, vents, engines and plates form these intricate towers in a city that's the very definition of tech punk. On a closer look and on the street level, things don't really make sense, but it doesn't matter because it's amazing to look at. Although it's clear everything is trash, it is not depressing. The strong, vivid colors, the strange angles and the vibe of these people make for a really fun and enjoyable trip. All the elements are there to make Sakara dystopia, insane leader included, but it's not. Although it's a textbook definition of a dystopic society, it didn't make me want to leave that place in horror. There's something appealing to this world and I'm pretty sure its design has a lot to do with it. It's joyful and full of unexpected, and I wouldn't be surprised if you'd find a part of the enterprise in it somewhere. This series of movies offers a unique view into how production design works to make architecture support storytelling. The first Thor had the challenge of making a world fitting for gods, while also keeping it in our realm of science, sort of. The term Golden City became literal with that version of Asgard. But what didn't really work design-wise was changed or abandoned altogether for the second movie. The monstrous size of Odin's tower was reduced and cut additional openings, not to mention the landscape makeover that helped the city feel more grounded. Different details on the Bifrost and the observatory that got a little steampunked, and that spinning floating something in the opening shot was never seen again, thank god. But the story in the second movie was darker thus in need of a different environment, so the glittering golden city became a stone one, 
The emblematic Tower of Odin and the Observatory were the only ones that kept the entire metallic finish, but the rest got aged. A lot. The entire city became denser, a little claustrophobic even, like the medieval cities of Europe. At this point, the third movie with its radical shift in tone could have gone either way, back to the golden shiny city or keep the last version and improve on it. They decided to keep what worked well for both movies that still served the story of this one. The resized Odin's Tower, the steampunk observatory and most of the city are pretty much the same. The grey, austere stone buildings got a retouch, most have shiny gold or copper roofs now, and intricate metallic decorations to brighten up the place and give it a more joyful look to accompany the comedy of Thor Ragnarok. This concludes the second part of Marvel Space Opera and it has been a real pleasure analyzing it. Hope you guys enjoyed it just as much. I also encourage you to subscribe because there are more movies coming and if you want to further support this channel while getting exclusive content, you can become a sponsor on Patreon, link is in the description below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time!